Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to another episode of Before Coffee. It is Mucking Fun Day, and we're having a lot of fun already. That's sarcastic. The weather just turned for the worse, and it started raining cats and dogs outside. Everything is on fire, or going to be on fire soon. And, uh, I'm sure there's something good happening somewhere. But we'll cover that tomorrow. Let's go ahead and get into our headlines. Something good somewhere. Uh, today on Before Coffee. Up to 16 degrees more than normal due to the heat episode these days in Spain. And in more weather related news, it's going to be stormy for Donald Trump today in New York. UK Foreign Office holding secret talks with Sudan's RSF paramilitary group. And we have news briefs on other American weather and the bypass for the key bridge in Baltimore. In culture news, encouraging Gen Z voters at the European elections through workshops. Those stories and more, which is National Pick a Wild Guest Day, April 15th, 2024 on Before Coffee. Get start over. I just realized I muted my own uh, my own mic instead of the uh, the music. Okay, let's read that again. <laughs> you gotta it's start the news hot. over again. It's I just have to read my article again. Uh, everything else pro is fine. It is very okay. hot. <laughs> Yeah. Right now, especially in places like the Mediterranean, where they're recording up to 16 degrees more than usual here in April, which is spring. The heat episodes this day is getting higher. For the moment, values up to 60 degrees above normal for the season in the Canary Islands. In addition to torrid nights, well, on the peninsula, up to 13 degrees more than average has been recorded in Orense, or Galicia. It has reached 32 degrees Celsius at the highest. On Thursday, on April 11th, no than the less than 15 medical ultra stations in the Canary Islands recorded temperatures of more than 35 degrees, as reported this Friday, or I guess April 12th, by the State Meteorological Agency, AEMET, on the social network Twitter. The spokesperson for AEMET, Ruben Del Campo, added for his part that we are immersed in an episode of very high temperatures for the time in most of the peninsula and the Canary Islands. Yesterday, values of between 35 to 38 degrees were exceeded in numerous Canarian observatories, according to the AEMET spokesperson. He has indicated that, for example, in Pajara, Puerta Ventura, 38 degrees were recorded in La Aldea de San Nicolas, or Gran Canaria, 38.5 degrees were recorded as well there. That's very hot for uh, any non -Far for Fahrenheit users out there. That's almost 100 degrees, and it's only April. It's only April, and they're almost getting to fever temperatures up here, or I guess down there in the Mediterranean. At the Tenerife South Airport, 38.3 degrees were reached, but that's an airport, so you know, <laughs> just tarmac for miles on end. <laughs> uh, with the observatory breaking the maximum temperature record record for the month of April by two degrees of difference, enforced since April 27, 2008. So it hasn't been this hot in Spain since 2008. Hot nights are no less than 25 degrees. Ruben del Campo has also specified that the heat at night has been very high on Thursday in at least half a dozen stations in the Canary Islands and does not drop below 25 degrees. That is, there were torrid nights in mid-April. The highest minimum temperatures recorded in Agumes Gran Canaria with 27.5 degrees according to AEMET data. On the peninsula, the highest daytime temperatures on April 11th occurred in the south of Galicia with 32.2 degrees in Orense, black points of the Guadinian and Guadalajara valleys, temperatures rose to 30 degrees. So for the next few days, heat and risk of fires. If you're living on the Mediterranean and especially in Spain, keep some water handy 
I guess, because you might ha get bushes catching on fire in the sun. Especially since they don't have their wet leaves, probably. I don't know, maybe they do. Uh, we're, we've sprouted leaves on a lot of our trees now here in April. But I'm also way more north, and I don't think we're going to be hitting this kind of temperatures ever. But who knows? Maybe we will, because as we know, our hot, hot planet is only getting hotter. The Meteorological Agency states on its website, a prediction in the coming days, the maximum temperatures will tend to increase in the northern hull, the Balearic Islands, and the west of the Canary Islands. While they will decrease in the west of Andalusia and the rest of the Canary Islands, the minimum temperatures decrease in the southern third and central areas and increase in the northern half of the peninsula and the west of the Canary Islands, they point out. Although it is likely that 30 to 32 degrees will still be exceeded in areas of the Canary Islands. On its official Twitter account, the AEMET also warns of the risk of fire in the coming days, which will be very high or extreme in Cantabrian, Mediterranean, and Canary Island areas. So stay safe out there, people in Spain, and people who happen to be visiting Spain. I mean, I guess get your tickets now before that it burns down because it's really warm already early summer coming to Spain this week that's my story oh, that's not cool literally not cool yep all right in US jurisprudence news uh, the Stormy Daniels testimony trial about to get underway which is involving the first ex-president to ever be put on trial in a criminal trial, and it's only one of four. One of four indictments against defendant J. Trump. This is from the Al Jazeera. Let's hopefully they aren't going to both sides this story again by saying, yeah. you know, George Bi Joe Biden wants a uh, heart crooked, you know, or something. Yeah. A comparable it's, analysis it's right there, better. yeah. Let's let's try to let's try to let's try to diminish this criminal, this obvious criminal, by just both siring all the way to the election. <laughs> Can't stand the media in this Not country. Gonna... Anyway, the story. Yeah. It is a blockbuster legal case that the dominate headlines for weeks to come. On Monday, defendant Jay Trump is, becomes the first United States president, past or president, to stand a trial of a criminal case. Jury selection is scheduled to be underway this week. The trial unfolding in New York centers on sensational allegations that Trump made hush money payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels, who, with whom he allegedly had an affair, which he, well, one night stand. He has been charged with 34 felony counts for falsifying business records. But despite these tabloid worthy details, legal experts say something more fundamental is the heart of the trial. How American elections unfold and how candidates should be held to account. Uh, I don't know if there's anything really going on other than an American citizen being charged with a crime. Everybody yeah. else adding all the extra shit to it doesn't change from the fact it's just a person being charged with a crime. I'm sorry. I don't know why they keep going. There's nothing more news media trying to add. You know, we already know who he is, okay? You know? The truth. Anyway, they keep on treating the story, him like right? a normal guy, like just your neighbor or something, yeah. There's, yeah, something more fundamental is at stake. It's like, yeah, well, can we can we actually lock up rich people? That's what's really fundamental. At stake. Yeah. The hush money payments allegedly happened against the backdrop of 2016 presidential allegedly, and prosecutors are expect. Here we go. With this allegedly nonsense. Okay, <laughs> somebody already went to prison for this. How is it allegedly? <laughs> I, I give up. Please. The way they 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 word these stories. The hush money payments happened against the backdrop of the 2016 presidential race, not allegedly. Okay, and prosecutors are expected to focus on whether efforts to conceal information could have influenced Trump's victory in that election. The more sort of details that nevertheless dominated public perception of the case. Well, that's even news media's fault, says Shannon Wu, a former federal prosecutor and political commentator. Mm -hmm. After all, Trump is accused of trying to buy. Daniel's silence over an affair that allegedly occurred while his wife Melania Trump was pregnant with her child Baron. To become shorthand, it's become shorthand to refer to this as a hush money case, or worse, as the porn star case. Wu said. Well, again, 
I don't remember that. I call it the Stormy Daniels case, I guess. Well, you respect women, moments, so, right? you know. <laughs> the, the, the trial will have broad consequences, and I'll commonly reflect on three other criminal indictments Trump faces, particularly those that concern his behavior during the 2020 election. Prosecutors are set to argue the hush money payments were part of a deliberate plan to help Trump's 2016 election, fully explained. Well, no shit. <laughs> a key pillar in that, that argument will be to establish Trump's willingness to circumvent normal rules and laws about how elections are done in order to win. That's a relatively important point to make, who added, calling the trial a previous whole attitude toward the election. Add to Monday's trial, Begin in April last year, that's when the Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg unsealed his indictment against Trump. In doing so, he made history. Never before had a current former president faced for criminal charges of any kind. Well, we could have avoided this by never having him president in the first place. That would have been the right thing to do. Trump has since been charged with three more criminal cases. In Georgia, he faces an election interference case. On federal level, he's facing one indictment for attempting to overturn the 2020 election and a second for allegedly hoarding, allegedly. A second for hoarding classified documents, allegedly my ass. The New York indictment, though, relies on state law designating that falsely falsifying business records is a misdemeanor crime, but doing so with the intent to defraud and intent to commit another crime is a felony. Mm -hmm. Or sure it is. The indictment did not initially identify the other crime in question, and Trump has not been charged with a secondary crime. Prosecutors, however, released a subsequent statement of facts saying Trump violated election laws. The falsifications, they said, were part of a scheme with others to influence the 2016 presidential election by identifying and purchasing negative information about him to suppress his publication. Months of court filings have further spelled out possible secondary crimes in question, including a violation, violating a federal election laws governing spending and disclosures in New York state law that criminalizes efforts to promote or prevent election of any person to a public office by unlawful means. Such laws are meant to protect voter information interests, said Ciara Torres Spilisky, a law professor and fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice. Hi, I'm a fellow. Hold on a second. This fan's, this fan's bugging me. Okay. <laughs> Better? I hope it is. Don't hear it. I don't it. know if you could hear that, but it sounded like, yeah, it sounded like a jet plane to me. <laughs> Torres Spilisky pointed out in the court proceeding to court precedent establishing voters' rights to certain information about spending and campaign activities during a special election. The transparency that is meant to ensure voters have the information they need to choose the candidate they feel that best represents their interests. The Supreme Court specifically ruled that disclosure helps citizens make choices in the political marketplace, Torres Spellesley said. Hiding the hush money payments, if there were meant to be influenced, the 26th election would undermine the key interest for American citizens. The judge overseeing Monday's trial, Juan Merchan, had previously voted in February that the possible federal state election violations were legally sufficient to move ahead with the felony charges. Legal experts expect the prosecution will have a relatively easy chan chance of establishing that Trump falsified business records by misrepresenting payments he made to his former lawyer and personal fixer, Michael Cohen. Of course, Michael Cohen went to prison, so it told me there's allegedly a crime in this case is not what you're doing properly here. Yeah, there was no alleged crime. There was a crime. Somebody went to prison for it. This ain't complicated. Stop saying allegedly. The prosecution alleged that Trump filed those charges as business expenses when they were actually used to reimburse Cohen for the payments to Daniels, but the falsification on its own would only constitute a misdemeanor crime. In addition, the hush money payments are not necessarily illegal. The real battle, therefore, is to establish that hush money payments were aimed at tweaking the 2016 presidential race and committing some other related crime. To lend the conviction on felony charges, District Attorney Bragg will almost certainly have to lean on into loftier themes related to U.S. democracy, according to Cheryl Bader, a professor at Fordham University of Law in the Bronx. I think Bragg has to overcome the challenge of this quote unquote. I'm sorry. I think Bragg has to overcome the challenge of this oversized defendant facing what may viscerally really feel like a minor technical reporting violation. Bader told Al Jazeera, he has to convince jurors that. Hushing Stormy Daniels is tantamount to election manipulation. 
and that Trump knew he needed the fake paper trail to hide the hush money payment so it wouldn't look like he paid her off, obviously. If you're paying somebody up and you're just paying them off, you just give them the money. You don't run it through other people, obviously. Yeah. He knew he was breaking the law. If you know you're breaking the law, you do stuff like that. It's the, the word stuff. Well, what's, what's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a term for it, but I'm not a lawyer. And then indictment. New York prosecutors also detail of this where Trump team sought to stifle potentially damaging information about public political fallout. They alleged Trump entered a catch and kill agreement with publisher of the National Choir, and of course, famously known uh, was it Michael Pecker, a tabloid to cross two other stories, one about the alleged affair with Playboy model Karen McDougal, and another from a former doorman who claimed Trump fathered a child out of wedlock. The agreement, they said, saw the inquire by the rights of stories only to bury them on Trump's behalf while he campaigned for office. That's why legal observers believe the timing of the payments is particularly significant. They were made in the waning days of the 2016 election. After the release of excess Hollywood videotape, in which Trump bragged about gra grabbing women's genitalia. Bitter, Bitter added that the prosecutors will have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt what have actually impacted the election. Well, oh, shit. I don't think it's easy to fucking prove. I don't think that's hard to prove, sorry. But they will have to prove that their investigations were done with the intent to commit another crime. Okay, this goes on for a little bit longer, but you get the gist of it. We'll stop talking about Trump. He's a big bag of skin that is a cancer on society, cancer in the world. He He's a huge to go joke. To jail. Sit in a little tiny cell and talk to himself for the rest of his life. That's yeah. what needs that. Back to you. As a <laughs> as a millennial, a young millennial, not young, an older. I guess I'm thirty now, but as a young, person younger than you, <laughs> I guess, yeah. uh, who plays video with your video game nerds all day, I do want to say that we talk about Trump, but only as a joke, right? That's how serious he is. Thank to you. at least the people I hang out with, we just mimic him make fun of him still never take it took him seriously ever even when he was president he wasn't a serious right. head of state he's always been so. a joke to me ever yeah. since i know where he was he's been a joke it's just he's really just weird to see meet like a the news media take him seriously all the time because like wow that's impressive yeah. that's so impressive it takes somebody that jokingly unserious serious well it's access journalism unfortunately yeah. They feel like, oh no, they're never going to come on our show. They're never going to talk to us again unless we're nice to them. So what? Who cares? Ratings. Once Don't ratings get in the news, you know what's going to Well, speaking of news, uh, something that's actually really important to our global world and global development is, of course, the war in Sudan, which is going towards its one year anniversary of shit going down. Um, nobody really talks about Sudan that much. Everyone wants to talk about Israel and Gaza or Ukraine, which they also deserve some spotlight, but Sudan just is not getting any spotlight, I, I feel, um, in comparison, right? If I go on, like, the news list, like, the, you know, scroll through the news, it's always like, Israel doing this, Gaza doing this, uh, Ukraine doing this, where's Sudan? Nowhere. But they're on one, one year with 8 million civilians already fled the country. And now the UK Foreign Office is holding secret talks with the RSF paramilitary group. This is from Mark Townsend on The Guardian. I'll, did I also, my last article, which I guess I didn't say, was on El Diado, um, a, a Spanish newspaper, which is why it was kind of hard to read, because I was reading it translated, so some of the, <laughs> the, the sentences weren't properly uh, translated. Foreign office officials are holding secret talks with a par paramilitary group that has been waging a campaign of ethnic cleansing in Sudan for the past year. News that the British government and the Rapid Support Forces RSF are engaged in clandestine negotiations has prompted warnings that such talks risk legitimizing the notorious militia, which continues to commit multiple war crimes while undermining Britain's moral credibility in the region. I just want to say they are legitimized because they're hurting people right now. Why would, like, <laughs> they are legitimate now. They have forced 8 million people to evacuate their own country. They're legitimate. <laughs> Don't legitimize them. Who gives a shit? They're hurting people. 
Uh, one human rights group described the UK's willingness to negotiate and try to save lives, God, how dare they, with the RSF as shocking. I'm sure this human rights group is doing something. In December, the US accused the paramilitary force of committing crimes against humanity as it carries out widespread massacres and rapes of civilians, many from the Afghan Mazalit ethnic community. The revelations came as the war between the RSF and Sudan's military reaches its first anniversary today on April 15th. Thousands of Sudanese civilians have been killed, while more than 8 million have been forced to flee their homes, and 18 million people are suffering crisis levels of food insecurity. And I'm sure they're also going to be suffering from the heat wave that's going to be sweeping through Sudan with the rest of the world. Among the crimes committed by the RSF is a rampage in Darfur that an UN report said left up to 15,000 dead and in Genenia, the capital of West Darfur state. The massacre prompted the comparisons to the genocidal massacres in the region two decades ago. Such atrocities, as well as reports of RSF fighters committing extrajudicial killings, I'm guessing that's trying to say they're being judged during executioner, looting aid, and widespread rape of women and children have profoundly weakened the group's legitimacy among the Sudanese people. Yet, a Freedom of Information, or FY, response reveals that senior Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, FCDO, officials instigated talks with the RSF. The most recent meeting between the UK and the paramilitary group was last month. The FOI response stated, FCDO has been both tried and been successful in contacting representatives from Rapid Support Forces. The last successful contact was on Wednesday, March 6th, when officials from the FCDO met with representatives from the RSF. UK officials added that so far, it had not met with RSF's feared leader, Mohammed Hamadan Dalgalo, widely known as Hemeti. Hemeti. The 49-year-old is a former commander of the Janjaweed militias, the RSF's forerunner, which was accused of genocidal violence in Darfur in 2003, and more recently has allied himself with Russia and its Wagner mercenaries. Or maybe they, maybe they, uh, isn't that one of the, the kind of, uh, conspiracy theories that, uh, Russia specifically allied themselves with this, uh, paramilitary group in order to create turmoil in the world in Sudan to distract from Ukraine or something. It's just a theory that I've saw, seen on the internet, right? This is only happening to distract you from everything else. The more things you pile up on the Western world having to deal with, the less more things they have to let go of. So maybe if they have to deal with enough conflict, right? In everywhere else, they'll just forget about Ukraine. And that's why you, Zelensky is fighting so hard to be like, guys, don't forget about me. Because he is probably worried that they will. But if I feel like more like more than likely people have forgotten about Sudan, so in January, Ahmed D launched a diplomatic tour of African countries, and what observers said was an attempt to portray himself as a viable leader. He visited Djibouti, Eth Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, Uganda, Ghana, and South Africa weeks after the head of Sudan's army, Abdel Fattah al Bran had made a similar tour as both generals tried to rally regional players to their side of the conflict. Which of course probably just made everyone want to stay away from them. Oh god, I don't want to get in the middle of this. Good luck guys. Mm. Dr. Sharatha Srinivasan, co-director of the Center of Governance and Human Rights at Cambridge University, said that although he understood the temptation to talk to the RSF, it was an approach that had only fueled violence in Sudan. Talking to the guys with the guns has been part of the perpetration of violence and authoritarianism in Sudan for the last two or three decades, he said. Pragmatism has got us nowhere. Oh, then what should we do? Bomb everyone? Like, uh, you know, I don't know what they want. What's their solution? I understand criticizing people for doing things, but not giving a solution is a... If you're, you know co-director of the Center of yeah. Governance and Human Rights, maybe you have an idea of what they could be doing instead. That's all. That's why ac academics exist, to help people learn and giving people other perspectives. Srinath Hassan, an expert on the failures of peacemaking in Sudan, added, on top of that, when the RSF are committing untold levels of targeted violence against ethnic groups and women and children, 
at a scale that is absolutely horrific and was, even 20 years ago, you're putting a lot of moral credibility and decency on the line. I don't think t trying to talk to people about why their ethnic cleansing approves of their ethnic cleansing. Why are they doing it? You know, I want, what's the answer to that? Mm -hmm. You know? Maddie Crosser, co director of the human rights organization Waging Peace, said, I'm shocked. It feels like a terrible move for the Sudanese. It will be experienced as a real slap in the face. He said global Sudanese diaspora would greet the news that the UK was secretly talking to the RSF as a complete abuse of the trust that the people have placed in the UK and other powers to negotiate or advocate on their behalf. Crowther said, There's, there'll be absolute shock, a real feeling of being completely let down by the UK government. He added that history proved talking to the RSF had yielded few positives. Before the most recent fighting broke out, the West had been attempting to coax the group towards embracing democracy. That's not to solve anything. I'm so I'm so tired of like, oh, I know what will fix this. Make them vote. You know what will fix it? Find out why they're doing it first. Like, why are they ethnic cleansing? What's the deal here? If you just say, oh, just become a democracy and vote, you just have people, you know, voter suppression. Hey, vote for the RSF. So we can continue going on. Hey guys, we're a democracy. Now we're legally ethnic cleansing, you know? <laughs> like, what the... <laughs> like, I don't understand how being able to vote for anything is going to solve whatever is the cultural issues are that's going on in here, over here. But... The UK talks also assume that the RSF are good faith actors, Crowther said. Chatting to the RSF have never resulted in outcomes that the UK says it wants to achieve in Sudan. I have no sense of why they would change at that moment. However, FCDO said the talks were an attempt to increase access to humanitarian aid and end the fighting against Sudanese Armed Forces, SAF, which are also accused of war crimes. Yeah, I'm sure there's war crimes all over. It's a freaking war-torn region right now. Foreign Office spokesperson said the UK continues to pursue all diplomatic avenues to end the violence, prevent further atrocities from occurring, press both parties in a permanent ceasefire to allow unrestricted humanitarian access to protect civilians, and to commit to a sustained and meaningful peace process. The SAF and RSF have dragged Sudan into an unjustified war with an utter disregard for the Sudanese people. We would do all we can to ensure they are both held accountable. It was an approach that had merit, according to Ahmed Soleiman, a senior research fellow at the Chatham's House of Africa program. How is aid going to get into Western Sudan unless you engage with the rapid support forces? They control 95% of Darfur, he said. Exactly. You're going to have to let them, if you want to give people aid, you have to ask the people to let you in. This is the dirty reality of war. It shouldn't negate engaging with civilians, but it has to be part of trying to ensure that there is a solution, both to the ending of the war in the near term and then providing assistance for civilians. I agree with this guy. However, the West's attempts at peacemaking have been under scrutiny since the war began. Of course, that's everyone loves to scrutinize. After diplomats helped create a power-sharing deal in 2019 with Hemdeti and Baran that accumulated in a conflict and chaos. You guys caused this! Srin Vasan said the problem in Sudan is that we've talked to them before and they asked to share power, something that resituated them in the center of government. So the danger is that in name of ending the violence, you talk to them, legitimate them, and bring them back in position of power. Who is the legitimate ruler of Sudan then? Just wondering. The British? Should they just recolonize Sudan? Is that what we're looking for here? Ah, these stupid Africans can't take care of themselves. We'll do it for them. Fresh attempts at peace deals are due to begin in Jeddah on Thursday, which I believe, if I can do, is the 19th of April, if I can do math properly. And the Saudi city hosted several rounds of talks last year before the army withdrew from negotiations alleging that the RSF had violated the ceasefire. So uh, good, lu good luck with Sudan. Hopefully they can figure out why, how, and to stop. And this won't be another long-winded conflict that's going to go on five years or something with countless civilian deaths and huge refugee expulsions, diasporas all over the world. But only time will tell. On to your story. Okay. No good segue except to cover the new uh, the weather again. 
70 million Americans, this is from ABC News, 70 million Americans under severe weather threat from northeast to midwest. These are news briefs, so uh, two short stories. From Sunday through Tuesday, well, Sunday was yesterday, hail, winds, and a few tornadoes are possible. Severe weather is projected to impact 70 million Americans from the northeast Monday through Tuesday in the Midwest. NOAA's Storm Prediction Center has issued an, an enhanced risk outlook for the multi-region storm system designated a level 3 out of 5 risk for severe weather. Well, that doesn't seem too bad. At least not a 5 or a 4. I guess so. In the Northeast, intense sun and storms are likely to develop late on Sunday afternoon in a corridor across the upper Ohio Valley into the Pocono Mountains in Pennsylvania and catch the region in upstate New York. Damaging winds, some hail and tornadoes are possible. The, snores, the storm spreads slowly southward into Sunday evening. A line of these strong to potentially severe thunderstorms is projected to impact cities from Pittsburgh to New York Sunday night from 10 p.m. That was last night, so this has already happened. In the, in the Midwest, a dynamic weather system across the Rockies and the Great Plains of Dakotas and Texas has the potential to form storm capable of becoming supercells and produce very large hail, damaging winds and tornadoes on Monday. Oh, Scattered God. severe thunderstorms are likely across the southern central Great Plains, mainly on Monday evening when large hail, damaging winds and few tornadoes are possible. It, and this map has got a big old system. It starts in southern Wisconsin and ends in Texas. Wow, that's huge. That's the whole country. And then there's one right here. Yeah, well, that's where kind of where it is right now, I guess. Oh, well, yeah. it's just the center of the country. That's where all the tornadoes are. Yeah, I know. I'm just saying that's the whole length, right? Texas to Wisconsin. No. No, it's not all of Texas. It's just a tip that's like some of Texas. Oh, okay. The stairs are very clear. Storms are luckily across the southern and central Great Plains, mainly Monday evening when large hail damage did that already. The storms begin as early as 5 p.m. Central Time from Central Texas to Nebraska and then continue to develop overnight across the region. By Tuesday morning, storms are projected to impact regions from eastern Nebraska to Kansas City, Missouri, and parts of Iowa. These storms may still be strong and possibly severe. The strongly storms are anticipated across the areas of Des Moines, Iowa, to Columbia, Missouri on Tuesday afternoon. Scattered severe thunderstorms are likely on Tuesday into the evening from Chicago to east of Dallas. That was the system I was talking about. Chicago to Dallas. Quite a big storm. On Wednesday morning, there may be lingering, there may be lingering, to, lingering strong, sorry. There may be lingering strong to severe storms in the Ohio Valley. So there's your story on the continuing weather, which happens every single day, basically. Yeah. And now back to the Baltimore Key Bridge disaster, which uh, happened a couple yes. weeks ago. Update. Like three weeks ago, we had that. How is it affecting traffic? This is from dailyvoice.com, Maryland. New I-695 interloop closure point to take effect Monday, Maryland Transportation Authority. With the entire East Coast continuing to adjust to the collapse of the Key Bridge collapse in Maryland, Okay, let me read this sentence again. Let's see what's wrong with it. With the entire East Coast continuing to adjust to the collapse of the Key Bridge Collapse in Maryland. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the collapse of the Key Bridge Collapse? I didn't mm -hmm. think the, the, I thought the bridge collapsed. Mm -hmm. Not the, the Key Bridge Collapse collapsed. <laughs> <laughs> we'll run this by our it's department. It's double now. collapse, no. Happens. You missed my, you missed my joke. Anyway. No, I heard you. We're just the Department of Re Department of Redundancy Department. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> okay. Beginning on April fifteenth, there will be a new closure point in effect on the interloop. If you're in Baltimore, this means a lot to you. Everywhere else, well, it's just information. According to officials, the closure will be at Maryland one fifty one North Point Boulevard, exit forty two, which will which will be the last exit for drivers. Outer loop closure remains intact at Maryland one seventy three, which is exit one. All traffic on I-695 interloop must exit at exit 42. Traffic bound on I-695 outer loop will take the eastbound 158 to the on-ramp to the outer loop. Write this all down. Traffic exiting the I-695 outer loop, wishing to return to the I-695 outer loop should follow the exit 42 
Maryland 151 North Point Boulevard, North to Cove Road. Motorists have been instructed to follow posted detours and warn that they can expect one lane, one travel lane on the outer loop from 158 to 151 overpass. So there's your little bypass news for Baltimore. Still dealing with the aftermath of the Key Bridge collapse here on the anniversary of the sinking of the Titanic. Back to you. Okay. Oh. Great updates overall. Because, I mean, and <laughs> watch out for those storms, I guess, going to the Midwest, which I'm sure people are used to by now living in the Midwest. Right on. It is Tornado Rally. <laughs> All right. Culture Thank news. You. Are you Gen Z? Are you voting? Well, Europe, if you live in Europe, they're making some creative workshops to try to engage the Gen Z into voting because most of them are voting age now, I believe, because I think Gen Alpha now is the current children in school. How the Change Maker Initiative is getting Gen Z to engage in voting ahead of the European Parliament election this year. This is from Euronews Culture by. Do, do, do. Let me scroll up. Johnny Walfist. How do you get the youngest generation excited about voting? This is the challenge an initiative is tackling ahead of this year's European elections. Changemakers is a wide-ranging initiative from the European University College Association, or EUC, capital A, that runs programs to engage young voters, voters across the continent. Its latest program, Gen Z Votes. Well, can't get any, That's creative name right there. It takes place over four events in four different countries with participants in the driving seat. They drive policy making and information campaigns around elections. Across events in Combra, Portugal, Catania, Italy, Thessaloniki, Greece, Dubrovnik, Croatia, 240 participants from 50 countries will brainstorm, film, and edit engaging video content aimed at sparking interest in other young voters to demand change. These videos are aimed are aimed to show the power of youth vote and how and why of different forms of civic participation in national and European elections and the EU policy and impact on everyday life, a spokesperson from the EUCA tells Euronews. The EUCA's main goal is to galvanize younger voters in believing in the power they have at the democratic citizens of the EU, EU enacting that power when it comes to the European Parliament elections in June. The way to achieve it is to talk to youth using their language and let them understand that they can engage with politics simply by being in their comfort zone. Social media. I'm pretty sure they know they can engage with politics and social media. That's where most of us do it. <laughs> where do you think people are getting in arguments about ideological positions on social media? The EUCA explains. Uh, I wonder how old the person who wrote that is and just like just to compare it's like oh this guy's 60 oh yeah you could use social media to talk about politics okay grandpa thanks for joining the rest of the world for the last 30 years ever since the first EP elections in 1979 electoral turnout has been in decline this trend reversed for the first time ever in 2019 for the last set of elections with a turnout of 50.6 percent up 8 percent points from 2014 Part of the reason for the uptrend in voter turnout was pinned on an engaged youth vote. Votes from under 25s increased by 14 pp that year since the last election. Belgium and Germany have both lowered their voting age to 16. During Malta and Austria, Greece also lowered its voting age to 17 ahead of the last set of EP elections. That's fun. I mean, if you can drink at 16 in Germany, you might as well be voting too. Of course, it's, I think it's the opposite way in the U.S., right? You can't drink, but you can vote. <laughs> uh, young Europeans strongly believe in EU values such as freedom, democracy, equality, and rule of law, so their main concerns are surely linked to their protection. Issues related to social justice, racial equality, and systematic discrimination have gained significant tractions among young adults, the EUCA says. Being able to have a say on important issues to young voters, such as diversity, climate change, and mental health, brought out new numbers of under 25 voters. Despite the increasingly engaged youth vote, though, Eurobarometer 2023 predicts that 21% of European age 18 to 25 won't go out to vote in upcoming elections. 
The events Gen Z Votes has organized are aiming to move the needle on that discrepancy. The four events include a video storytelling workshop, a hackathon, a video Olympics, and a workshop on the guerrilla marketing campaign. The first three workshops have already taken place. Okay, so why didn't you report on this earlier? Now th they missed the first three workshops. With the uh, guerrilla marketing workshop in Dubrovnik yet to run later this month. Over 25 to 28th of April, 90 young students will come to the Croatian city to create video content designed to encourage youth voting. The students will learn about guerrilla marketing techniques before taking on the streets of Dubrovnik to make the videos and editing them to publish in advance of the elections. From the previous three groups, there are already 350 videos online on EUCA social media platforms. I want to watch some of these in my own free time and then laugh or something. Content aimed at young people by the young people is more likely to gauge as it puts the important matters in understandably context. Skibbly toilet, vote for your nearest politician. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not Gen Z or Gen Alpha, so I have no idea about the memes. I'm sorry. I'm old. I'm officially old now at 30. So, according to the results of the 2021 year. Sorry? I guess Gen Z starts in 97. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so they would be 27 okay. this year. I like to call myself Thank an in betweener, similar to how you're an in betweener, mm -hmm. right? You're in between. You're in a weird spot between Boomer and Gen X, and I'm in a weird spot between Gen Z and Millennial. So yeah, it's just an arbitrary nonsense, yeah. if you ask me. You're yeah. right. <laughs> Do you see which resembles over I have 18, nothing in common with Boomers. Nothing. Oh, okay. anyway, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Boomers could have been gone to Vietnam. Right? Yeah. They could have been drafted. <laughs> exactly. Right. The EUCA, which represents over 18,000 students across 17 EU countries, found that they were still some major roadblocks to youth engagement. First, many of the people do not know enough about the European Union and its functioning. They consider the EU distant from their daily lives and have a general lack of trust in the political system as they feel underrepresented. I mean, as somebody who's actually studied the European Union, it does have a very distant effect to their daily lives. It is the broader, in a way it's the federal government, right? It has a broader lookout of all the EU states. It tells the EU states what things they should be doing, but the EU states don't have to listen to them, really, because they don't have any actual power to enforce any of the rules. It's an economic union. Yeah. It's not I a still, political union. I will always argue local elections are the most ele most important election. That, that definitely needs to be looked at, because I don't think they get a, a very high turnout, and they're probably the most important to your daily life. Either way. Amazing. Moreover, young people may not have access to sufficient information about the voting process, candidates, and political issues, which discourage them from participating. Finally, young people have a sense of disinterest or disconnect regarding the potential influence on political decision-making processes. Some may believe that their vote doesn't count or won't make a difference in the outcome of an election. In the age of social media dominating the way people receive news, the Gen Z Votes campaign focuses on tackling disinformation by empowering young voters to get involved with the creation of election promotional content themselves, aims to turn the youth vote into one of the strongest demographic blocks on the next European elections. They're also usually the largest population block, which is why it's very important that young people vote because they are the most there, especially after COVID, I think they're the most there. <laughs> Uh, with all this brain fog going around and the older <laughs> the older people with their brain fog from COVID, catching COVID. Uh, it's generalized. <laughs> Where am I? What year is it? Oh what? my god, I can't believe all these old people are stupid. Yeah. But that's my that's my article on getting the Gen Z to vote in the European elections. And uh, on to this day in history. All right, this day of history, 1920. We're not really going back that far. April 15th, 1920. Make sure I get the right day, because I've been scrolling. Two men were murdered in South Braintree, Massachusetts, leading to the Sacco Vanzetti case and the still controversial conviction of the two Italian immigrants. I like how they say still controversial. Like, one day it's going to stop being controversial. I don't know. <laughs> The still controversial assassination of Martin Luther King. Yeah. Yeah, it's still controversial. 
1924, the Rand McNally Auto Chum was released. It was the American Publishing Company's first road atlas, and it was called the Auto Chum. Makes you feel like you should be feeding it the sharks or something. I don't know. 1926, Robertson Aircraft, one of the companies, Robertson Aircraft, one of the companies that later developed into American Airlines, flew its first mail route between Chicago and St. Louis, Missouri, with Charles A. Lindbergh as the pilot. So he started as a mail boy. 1947, Jackie Robinson, who broke baseball's racial barrier, played in his first major league game for the Brooklyn Dodgers at Ebbets Field. And this day, 1947, the color barrier in baseball came down. 1955, American fast food pioneer Ray Kroc opened the first McDonald's franchise, launching an enterprise that would eventually become the world's largest fast food chain in Des Plaines, Illinois. Or Des Plaines, Illinois. I don't know how to pronounce it. Or Illinois. Illinois, Illinois. 1980, French novelist and playwright Jean Paul Chetre, who was the leading exponent of existentialism. Satre or Satter, or however you pronounce it, died at the age of 74. 1989, tragedy occurred. Hillsborough Stadium in Sheffield, England, and a crush of football fans resulted in a 96 deaths and hundreds of injuries. Police mistakes were later blamed for the incident. Police mistakes, that's pretty general. In 2000, the year 2000, U.S. President Bill Clinton established the giant Sequoia National Park at a preserve near National Sequoia National Park covering more than 500 square miles of Sequoia National Forest in the Sierra Nevada of California. In 2003, U.S. President George W. Bush declared that the government of Saddam Hussein in Iraq had fallen as a result of the Iraq War in the following day as the United Nations list sanctions against Iraq and that totally unnecessary waste of time war which accomplished nothing. To 2013, near the finish line at the Boston Marathon, two homemade bombs were detonated in a crowd of spectators. Three people were killed and more than 260 were wounded in a terrorist attack at the Boston Marathon. Is the Boston Marathon today, too? I think it is. I think it is. They have it on Patriot Day, which is the 18th of April, but I think they typically have it on a Monday during the week. The history of Notre Dame, Notre Dame Paris fought fire during the restoration came, uh, campaign and the blaze destroyed most of the cathedral's roof, the 19th century spire, and some of the rib vaulting. That happened five years ago today. And our time capsule event, let's see if this one's of any significance. April 15, 1964, President Johnson announced that U.S. and Colombia had agreed to begin the immediate study of the feasibility of a sea level canal linking the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans in Colombia. Through Colombia. So, like an alternative to the Panama Canal. I don't think that got off the ground. Our featured event, 1912 on this day, the sinking of the Titanic. And this day in 1912, the British luxury passenger liner Titanic sank in around to New York City from Southampton in Southampton, Hampshire, England, after sinking the iceberg, sink after surfing. after striking an iceberg during its maiden voyage, some fifteen hundred people died. Feature biography: Leonardo da Vinci. No, not the turtle, Leonardo, not Leonardo DiCaprio. Leonardo da Vinci, Italian artist, engineer, and scientist, was born on this day, April fifteenth, fourteen fifty-two, in Vinci, Italy. Died in 1519, May 2nd, at Cos Luce, France, at age 67. Other birthdays today Leonard Le Leonhard Uller, Swift mathematician, was born in 1707. Sorry, rented lips. 1912, Kim Il sung, president of North Korea, was born, former president of Kim Il sung. 1959 is the birthday of Emma Thompson, British actress and writer. 1960s birthday of Philippe King of Belgium. And 1982 is the birth of Canadian actor Seth Rogen. I didn't know he's Canadian. Seth Rogen burned this day, 1982. He's just a young pup of 
42. I don't know, it seems like he might be older than that. I don't know why. Even though he actually a juvenile boy, but he's 42. Yeah. And what day is it today? It's National Tax Day. That's right. If you're going to the post office in the United States today, there's lots of people standing in line mailing in tax checks because they owe taxes. Of course, if you get a refund, you, you file early. But if you owe taxes, <laughs> you wait till April 15th at midnight <laughs> to pay. And the post office, I believe, will stay open until midnight. And I just to postmark your taxes so you don't get a fine. National Take a Wild Guess Day, which is every day for me anyway. National Rubber Eraser Day. I think in England they call erasers rubbers. I think that's what they call them, right? <laughs> it's also it's also National Titanic Remembrance Day. We just remembered a couple of months ago, in case we ever had a chance of forgetting it. It's National Laundry Day, which is every day, as far as I know. National Laundry Day today, so everybody got to go and do their laundry. Every day's laundry day. Drain your drain your city's water resources all at once. National Purple Up Day and National Glazed Spiral Ham Day. Not not just regular ham. It's got to be glazed and it's got to be spirally cut. And spiral cuts one of them things where you just like I learn a wire through it and it's really fast and cuts it all the way down. Then you glaze your ham. So glaze your ham and take a wild guess and uh, remember the Titanic and do your laundry. That's your days for today. April 15th, 2024 on the 4th off. All right. I do want to... Purple Up Day is all about the children of the armed forces who... Don't get enough. The unsung heroes who have to deal with... Where's dad? Oh, he's gone on rotation for six months. So you're not going to see him for a while. <laughs> Where's dad? Or, or mom. Mom can also be there. Where are my parents? They're in the military. You'll see them. Oh, we have to move again. Why? Because I'm getting transferred to a new base. Oh, yay. I don't know what it's like to have friends. Because I'm always in a different military base every year. Huh. Right. Well, I wouldn't know. I'm not. I don't. I was never really a military kid, but uh, I have known a lot because we did live in a neighborhood near a base, and there were a lot of kids. Who were like, "What happened to that what kid? Oh, they moved away. Their family got transferred. So you're never gonna see them again. <laughs> they went to Germany. I think one of my first in-game like school crushes just went to Germany. Never came back. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, we went to their goodbye party, I think, when back uh, when we lived uh, near Great Mills or whatever. They just, we went to their goodbye party, they went to Germany, <laughs> they got transferred to Germany, never saw them again. <laughs> what does this have to do with the uh, National Titanic Remembrance Day? No, no, Purple Up Day. Oh, Purple Up Day. I, yeah, that's uh, for the... I guess I missed that one. Yeah, it's uh, for oh, okay. children of military, active duty oh. military people. Oh, I got you. The oh, yeah, unsung heroes who have to live in a world where at least one of their parents isn't around. Or they're always right. moving. And they probably have they're to go to military, military, freaking military school and they have to go, yes, sergeant to their own father or something no, like that. I don't think they go to military school. <laughs> These are all stereotypes, of course, but that is like the famous thing, right? Like you have to, yes, sir, to your own father. You know, you have to, in your head. You have to salute your own dad because you're in the mil, you're a military kid. Anyways, enough of that. Uh, I hope you guys have a good too. Monday. Uh, stay safe out there with the different, the tornadoes, the hail. It just freaking rain cats and dogs here. Don't catch on fire. And uh, we will see you tomorrow yeah. for some good news on Good News Tuesday. Here is your mic drop moment. Ms. Chupant, I believe you have a filter turned on in the video settings. Uh, you might want to uh, uh, take, take We're a trying look. to, we're tr can you hear me, Judge? I can hear you. I think it's a filter. It, in the it is, and I don't know how to remove it. I've got my assistant here. She's trying to, but uh, I'm prepared to go forward with it. That's, I'm here live, I'm not a cat, I'm not a cat, I'm not a cat, I'm not a cat, I can, I can, I can see that. I'm not a cat, 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 I'm not a cat
sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notify buttons, and follow our other channels, Toxic Alley, History of Gravy, and Scratchy Old Records.